from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Sharon Creech. She, as you all know, obviously, from your uh, being here, <laughs> she has won a number of Reader's Choice Awards, and she's definitely a Reader's Choice writer for anyone who's read her many books. She had, as she describes, a noisy, rowdy family when she was growing up, and her real-life siblings actually served as the basis for several of her characters. So those of you who have siblings out there, you might start paying more attention to them. They could turn out to be among your best characters. Her Newbery-winning Walk to Moons was written more than 30 years after her family took a car trip from, Idaho, from Ohio to Idaho, with all five kids, no doubt, living up to that noisy, rowdy reputation. Her newest book is The Unfinished Angel, about an angel with attitude. And those of you who've read any of her books know that she's a born storyteller, despite the fact that she once wanted to be an ice skater. <laughs> Lucky for us, she changed her direction. There's a character in her book, Love That Dog, Jack, who says, I tried, can't do it, brain's empty. I think we all will all agree that Sharon Creech's brain is never empty and always runs on full. So please join me in welcoming Sharon Creech. Thank you. Whoa, there are millions of you here. Woo. Thank you for coming out on this almost wet day. I have my grandchildren right down here in the front, Pearl and Nico and my daughter, Karen, and her husband, Mark, who was just on, am I allowed to say, on White House duty. Got to go to Malia's soccer game, and, but he couldn't get out of the car. So <laughs> there he was on press pool. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you're here instead of at Malia's soccer game. Um, good afternoon. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about my newest book, The Unfinished Angel. And then I'm going to ask my editor to come up here with me and read a couple of the lighter scenes from this book. And then there'll be about probably about 10 minutes for questions. Sounds like a plan? Okay. The question I am most often asked is, where do you get your ideas? And that question always reminds me of something Albert Einstein once said. When asked if he kept a journal of ideas, he replied, well, I only ever had the one idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am often inspired by other people's words. Sometimes a line or two or maybe a small poem will resonate so strongly that it generates a whole story of my own, as if the sound of someone else's words has called forth a host of words and images that were sleeping in here, waiting to be set free. With Love That Dog, for instance, and we have a, a couple here who claim that they met and were married because of that book. Will you raise your hand? You can ask them later. I feel great responsibility for this marriage. <laughs> With Love That Dog, it was one stanza from a poem by Walter Dean Myers that inspired me. His poem, Love That Boy, begins like this. Love that boy like a rabbit loves to run. I said, I love that boy like a rabbit loves to run. Love to call him in the morning. Love to call him, hey there, son. Well, that poem, that little poem, jump-started a whole book for me about a much-loved boy named Jack and about poetry. And that's the book called Love That Dog. It was also someone else's lines that jump-started my newest book, The Unfinished Angel. When my granddaughter Pearl was two years old, she told her first story. It's very short, and it goes like this. Once upon a time in Spain, there was an angel, and the angel was me, the end. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> how did she know how to begin a story like that. How did she know what Spain was? 
I mean, think about it. And how did she know what an angel was? And could she have once been an angel in Spain? Well, if you look at her, you'll know that she could have been. Well, I later learned that my daughter, Pearl's mother, had been reading Ferdinand. Hopefully... It's back on. Woo! Who did that? Thank you. Shall I go ahead? Bless you. All right. Are you ready? <laughs> I was telling you, I'm going to talk real fast now to make up for the time. <laughs> I was telling you about my granddaughter's story. Once upon a time in Spain, there was an angel, and the angel was me, and I was wondering, wow, how did she know how to start a story like that, what an angel was? And I, then I learned that my daughter had just recently read Ferdinand the Bull to her, which begins, once upon a time in Spain, there was a bull. So that explains Spain. But the angel, I don't know. So I was fascinated, and I wanted to know more, and I wanted the whole story. And for years, I kept thinking about that line, and I would say it in my head at night like a mantra, hoping that the idea would come to me in my sleep. I'd say, once upon a time in Spain, there was an angel, and the angel was me. Once upon a time in Spain, there was the angel, and the angel was me. But nothing came. The brain was empty. <laughs> well, then in 2007, my husband accepted a one-year position in Switzerland, and we returned to Switzerland to a boarding school at which we had first worked 25 years ago. And as soon as we arrived there, the story began coming together. On the campus is an old stone tower, about four stories high, and it's several hundred years old. And I knew instantly that that's where the angel would live. So not Spain, but Switzerland. And I knew that the whole village, the mountains, the paths, the rock walls, 
and old sheds and tiny lizards were part of the story. And every day I looked out of a window at the valley below and at the mountain opposite, and I wrote the story, and I found the angel. The angel has a distinctive voice, and I think I can explain how that evolved. I was immersed in relearning Italian, the language of southern Switzerland, and my brain was doing peculiar things. Not only could I not speak English correctly, uh, not only could I not speak Italian correctly, but I could no longer speak English correctly. They were like fusing, half English, half Italian. Ordinary words mutated, like words like impressed became impressified. And I, instead of saying I was glad, I would say I was gladful. You know, people were beginning to look at me like I was a little bit off my rocker. And I would try to speak English, but then I would end up using Italian um, syntactical phrasing. Like I would say, is that the car of you, the car red, or the car blue? And again, people, were, they're very forgiving, though, um, in Switzerland. And you know, they'll, they'll take whatever you say. But instead of struggling with this brain gone awry, I decided, you know what? Let's just let this be the voice of the angel. Maybe this is the way the angel will talk. And that way, I can just get on with writing my story. And so that's what I did. So this is a story of an angel with attitude. She's disenchanted with peoples, with the stupid things they are doing, and with, as she says, so much saying, so much talking all the time, day and night, all those words spilling out of those mouths. Why so much? Why don't they be quiet? Well, the angel, like me during that year, struggles with language. She, or is it he, says, I am supposed to be having all the words in all the languages, but I am not. Many are missing. I think I did not get all the training. But no matter, the angel invents words when she needs them, or he needs them. When I begin a book, I rarely know what I am doing or where I am going. And this, too, is reflected in the angel who says, do the other angels know what they are doing? Am I the only confused one? Maybe I am unfinished, an unfinished angel. And that became the title of the book, The Unfinished Angel. I mentioned earlier the stone tower in which the angel lives. Well, the real stone tower is on the campus of Tassus, the American school in Switzerland. And the charismatic 96-year-old founder of that school was living in the villa attached to the tower when I was writing this story. And when I told her about this story in progress, she said, soon I will be that angel. Here is what the angel says about the tower. My tower. Maybe my tower, the tower of Casas Rosa, is not the most attractful or the most specialty tower in Switzerland. It is just a tower, after all, like so many other towers in the Ticino, this southern part of Switzerland. She has an Italian accent. I'm trying to do it. <laughs> it is a tower that stands tall and upending like a good soldier for nearly 400 years, not wobbling or falling down. At the top of the tower is an open balcony with a low wall all around and a tile roofling overhead. There are no windows. You reach out and there is the air, just there. You are high, high above the other houses and the only things as high are a few trees and down the road the tall, stickly spire of the church. Well, one day a feisty young girl named Zola comes to live with the father in the villa. And Zola is a good match for the angel. Between the two of them, they manage to rescue a band of orphans and wake up the sleepy village. And in the process, the angel rediscovers a mission. I'd like to read a few of the lighter scenes from this book, very short. And for that, I've asked my editor and publisher, Joanna Kotler, to join me. Joanna? Sound man, hello. Is the Hi, extra everyone. mic turned on? Is it? Is, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Right. Joanna is not just any editor. For years, she had her own imprint at HarperCollins called Joanna Kotler Books. And in the front of each of my books, you'll see that at the bottom of the page, the title page, Joanna Kotler Books. She is smart, astute, kind, and funny. 
She is also a talented artist. She is brilliant, and I'm honored to work with her. <laughs> Joanna is going to read the part of Zola, and I'm going to be the angel. The Unfinished Angel by Sharon Creech. Angel? Angel? That's Zola. I do not know about this American girl Zola who has come to the village. She is skinny like the twig tree with hair chip-chopped in a startling way. Her eyes gray with large black popples in the middle. Her eyes are big and round like a cow's. She appears overall, I don't know how to say, like, like maybe a fawn who grew up with humans or, or a chickadee who was raised by crows. I don't know. Zola wears many clothes on top of other ones like this. Three dresses, one atop each other, or sometimes two skirts under a third, and layers of scarves around her middle and her neckle and in her hair. It is not even cold out, I am telling you. It is summer. I thought maybe she did not have the cupboard for her to put her clothes in, and so she had to wear everything she owns. But there is much space in this house. Maybe she cannot choose and just keeps adding clothing until it surpluses her. Often Zola clambers up into my tower and pelters me with questions. Angel, where is your sword? What is sword? You don't know what a sword is? Angels used to have swords. They used to fight, you know. They weren't always sweet and loving and peaceful. She thinks I am sweet and loving and peaceful? Angels used to ride flying white horses and slash swords and throw thunderbolts. They were strong like warriors. They defeated evil beings in long and mighty battles. Those were some amazing angels. Do you do anything like that? I can tell she really wants me to say yes, and I am even considering saying yes because then she will be impressified with me. <laughs> but before I can answer her, she says, Are angels dead people? What? What? No, I am not a dead people. I am an angel. A people is a people, and an angel is an angel. Okay, okay, take it easy. Hmm, hmm. So, are you a boy angel or a girl angel? What? I don't know why she's making me so fidgeted. <laughs> I'm not used to people seeing me, and I'm especially not used to people asking me questions. It's hard to tell. You could be a long-haired boy, or a sturdy girl. I am an angel. I thought you knew a lot about angels. I am not a boy or a girl. I am angel. 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 Ah, it's just that in churches, you know, sometimes the angels look like women in long dresses. Sometimes they look like boys. Sometimes babies. Oh, churches. I do not know about all those angels. This is something very confusing to me. Never I see these angels in real, only in stone and in paintings. Do some angels look like that? Am I supposed to look like that? I asked Zola what I look like. What you look like? You don't know what you look like? How would I know? In a mirror, I behold white fogness. <laughs> do I look like white fogness to you? No, no. You look like, now yeah, don't get mad. You look like a person. No, not a people. Well, well, wait, not exactly, no, no. You have the shape of a person and a pleasing face. Pleasing? Attractable? Yes, pleasing, I would say. The robe, hmm, is a bit long and crooked. It is? Yes, but it's also sort of regal. You know what regal is? Of course, like king, like queen. Where do the wings go? Wings? What wings? Don't you have wings? I thought sure that first time I saw you that you had wings. I feel like I'm going to bust into the tower walls and crumble into a thousand pieces. I do not have wings. I say it slowly so that I do not sound too mad, but I am feeling hurt. I am not a bird, I am an 
angel. Okay, okay, calm down. I am calm. I am very, very calm. I am not calm. <laughs> angel, I will tell you something. You do not have to tell me any more things. No, I need to tell you this. It is about my younger brother, Jake, about when he was born. Jake came way too early, two months. I have seen babies like that, Zola, in such a hurry, you know, they don't blah, blah. We were afraid. Yes, yeah, Zola, people get afraid when the babies, Angel, they come. Angel, please, let me just tell this, okay? Well, I was only trying to be a good hearing aid <laughs> and contribute something now and then to show the sympathy. Angel, we were afraid for Jake, such a tiny, tiny baby. He was in an incubator, a tiny shriveled bird, no bigger than this, with wires poking here and there, such a skinny, puny, pitiable thing. Oh, yes, I know what you're saying. Wait, Angel. On top of the incubator, just above Jake's head, someone had fastened a miniature golden angel, maybe from a necklace or something. The angel was gazing down into the incubator. Oh. That is a nice thing, that angel on the incubator. But wait. While I am standing there, an eerie glow of blue-white light appears in the corner of the room, and the glow comes closer and closer to the incubator, and then it moves up to the ceiling and hovers there and takes shape. I rub my eyes. It appears. Now, don't get mad, Angel. Why would I get mad? I won't get mad. Angel, the blue-white light became, well, it looked like, a pigeon. <laughs> a pigeon? Yes. A pigeon? Yes. It gave off a very comforting feeling, and I knew it was an angel. An angel? Yes. Zola, a pigeon is not an angel. Well, yes, it might seem that way, but this angel... Zola, angels are not pigeons. I knew you would get mad. I am not mad. You are. I'm not but I am mad. <laughs> How can people go around thinking angels are pigeons or pigeons are angels? Do you want to hear more? Oh, what I really want is to float up into the mountains to see the goats and stop from hearing the nonsense about the pigeons. But I am a polite angel most of the time. And so I say, of course, go on talking. So we did not know if shriveled Jake would live, not for this minute or this hour or this night or that day. Every minute, every day, we are watching his tiny chest go up and down, and always there is the blue white pigeon. Do you have to call it a pigeon? But that's what it looked like to me. Remember, I was only six years old. Couldn't you call it maybe just the light? Angel, try not to be so bothered by the pigeon. But a pigeon is not... Oh, sorry. Every day and every night, the pigeon was there protecting Jake. Well, the pigeon is Just listen not. to me, please, please. One day, Jake was breathing all on his own and opening his eyes and taking a bottle and waving his fingers, and that's when the blue light left. The pigeon? Yes. The pigeon went away? Yes. I cannot help myself. I have to ask Zola one more question. Zola, do you think I look like a pigeon? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> we love that angel. We love that pigeon. And that's why there's on a, a pigeon on the cover. Um, there's more to the story of the angel. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, I want to tell you one quick funny thing that's happening now. I'm getting emails from people in the language of the angel, and they're saying things like, here's one I got yesterday. Um, I'm gladful that you wrote this strangeified book. <laughs> <laughs> so there, this story, this angel, this Zola, this pigeon, it's all sparked by one line from my granddaughter six years ago. Once upon a time in Spain, there was an angel, and the angel was me. So Pearl... Thank you. Angel, I thank you. Audience, I thank you. We have two minutes. 
Thank you so much. Thank you especially for your patience during the outage. But because of that, we've only got two minutes for questions. I'm so sorry. So, but can we take, let's take maybe two questions over here. And is there another mic over here? Or no? I'm sorry. We, I would have loved to have had like 50 questions, but we're going to do two at least. Yes. Go uh, ahead. What? What? <laughs> Did you forget your question? That's all right. Think for a minute. Does someone I else have one there? <laughs> How did you actually um, <coughs> learn English um, again? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I'm not sure I actually have learned it again <laughs> because I still, I still sometimes say words in a strange way. But I think... I had to leave Switzerland and stop hearing Italian in order to relearn English. Great question. Get, uh, the gentleman behind you, yes. Hi, um, my sister, she couldn't be here because she was sick, but she had a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, what was your inspiration for writing Walk Two Moons? Walk Two Moons, ah, my daughter who's here um, had just gone back to the States for college. We were living in England at the time and she went back to the States for college, and I was so bereft. I missed her so much, but I decided to maybe turn that uh, loneliness around and write from the point of view of a young girl whose mother had gone away. And so I wrote about also the U.S., which I was missing, and my daughter, and that's how that came. But also the title of the book and much of the uh, theme of the book came from a fortune cookie message I found in the bottom of my purse. I received it in a Chinese restaurant in England, and it was a Native American proverb, <laughs> don't judge a man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. So save those fortune cookie messages. I want to get the young man who started out and forgot. Oh, yes. I just, oh, I remember. <laughs> What's your favorite book ever? My favorite book ever by anybody? Whoa, too hard to choose. Do you have a favorite book ever? What? The Trumpet of the Swan. Oh, The Trumpet and the Swan. That's very nice. Good choice. Do we, yes, just give, speak real loud. How did I get the idea for Chasing Redbird? That one I wrote right after I wrote Walk Two Moons. And in Walk to Moons, I'd written about a place called Bybanks. And I really wanted to write more about this place called Bybanks, but I didn't want to continue the story of Walk to Moons. So I thought, well, what if I wrote about someone who was the friend of that main character in Walk to Moons? And so that's sort of how that came about. I think we've got time for one last question. We'll do it right here from the front, unless my grandchildren have a question. I get the last. <laughs> but yes. Love that dog was inspired by that little poem by Walter Dean Myers, which the one that was, Love that boy like a rabbit loves to run. Well, I had it on my bulletin board for many years, and one day I just looked at it and I started thinking, boy, that father really loves his son, and if his, that son is so loved, I bet the son loves something, maybe like his pet. And so that's how this whole story of Love That Dog came out. Did my grand, did Nico or Pearl have a question? Yeah, they can ask me questions anytime. Thank you, everyone. You've been brilliant. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.